Hello and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you, whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. I'm Ron. Je m'appelle Jean-Marie, je suis American. Uh, that's Jean-Marie. Collectively, we're the hosts of Podcast DX. Today, we are talking about colorectal cancer, which affects 1.8 million people worldwide. Yeah, that's a lot of people. Um, here in the U.S., it affects approximately 200,000 people a year. And mostly, our, most of these people are ages 60 and up. But younger people have been affected more frequently in the past 40 years or so. And the incidence has increased 1% to 2% each year. The American College of Gastroenterology has already suggested that African Americans should start routine screening at 45 because they have um, slightly higher odds of getting colorectal cancer than Caucasians. In addition, anyone with a first degree relative, so like your parents or brother or sister who's been diagnosed before the age of 60, should really start getting tested earlier um, at either ages four, at age 40 Yep. And then every 10 years um, before... Age of diagnosis of the relative. youngest relative. Okay. So, so in other words, if your relative was mm-hmm. diagnosed at age 30, right, you should get it at age 20. Holy cow. Yes. Wow. Because well, they want to get it 10 years before okay. it starts. Well, I know my doctor suggested um, getting uh, tested at age 40. Okay. I mean, and we don't have a first... First line. Degree relative. Well... Yep. Oh, well. Okay. They just like to do the scope. Well, I'm glad we're uh, protected. Being cautious. Well, what exactly is the screening? Is it just a doctor's exam, or what do they do? Oh no, uh, you, you have to go to the doctor's exam. You know, to the doctor's visit to start with, but then you need a colonoscopy, and that would be done to rule out any abnormal tissue growths in the colon. And the colon is the largest intestine, right? Yes. Well, what's involved in a colonoscopy? Well. Can we flip a coin to see who's going to answer this one, Mom? Um, I'll take heads and you take tails. <laughs> Very funny. I'll cover the testing. Okay. Uh, colonoscopy is a visual exam of the colon or large intestine with a camera mounted on the end of a flexible lighted tube. The test is completed after a thorough intestinal cleaning by way of a nasty tasting <laughs> drink that empties you out more than you ever thought possible. Okay, wait, let me point out that this nasty drink, I used to have to drink, what, every day? Yeah, but now you have the other stuff. I know, but I mean, I Isn't used to nice? have to drink it every single day. So, Aren't you happy? So just keep in mind, if you're only having to be tested, you know, every couple every of years. 10 years. Yeah. But be you happy. were pretty cleaned out, though, Jean, right? Oh, after that she was. No, I just, um, because I have had she got, her head intestines injury, don't. Her, her my intestines, intestines don't, don't move. move. So my options are to take medication every single day or to have them removed. And I decided I wanted to keep them. For but now. she takes she takes four different types of medication instead of drinking the. And I'm very very careful. Nasty stuff every day. Yeah. It does taste really bad. It's terrible. It's also like very salty, which causes your colon to respond. And yeah, okay. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, my advice, mm-hmm. if you're going to have a colonoscopy and you have to have the testing, okay, is have good reading material handy in the commode. Okay. And something that they sell in the baby care aisle at the store called butt paste. I'm thinking also like really good toilet paper. Yes, so yes, that- nice toilet paper. Not- Don't get sandpapery toilet paper. Okay. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because the constant bowel movement can really do a number on your backside. Okay, then. Um, possibly way too much information. Uh, next time, no coin toss. Right. Okay. Well... If it's helpful information, I guess people do have the right to know. Sure. So, Lita, uh, continue on. Tell us what's next after you are prepped. Okay, this is the fun stuff. Well, I guess it's all fun. Hmm. The following day... It's all fun and games till somebody sticks a camera up your butt. (laughs) The following day, you show up at the hospital with a driver because they do not let you drive yourself. They're going to give you sedation, a medication for the procedure that will make you unable to operate a vehicle afterwards. Some people actually choose not to have sedation, from what I've been told. I can't understand why you would want to be fully awake, but that's my preference anyway. The test itself is completed when a doctor inserts a half-inch diameter long tube, so half-inch diameter, first of all, long tube, secondly, with a light at one end, into the rectum, and the doctor can observe any abnormalities as he or she progresses the probe 
through the large intestine or colon. If there are growths called polyps, they can be biopsied during the procedure. If not, then they move you to the recovery room and you wake up from sedation and you're done for 10 years. And that's a... Never. That's a colonoscopy. Yeah, okay. That's the test for colorectal cancer. Yes. Well, that testing seems benign. Hopefully always. Well, what about the cancer itself? Jean, um, can you talk to us about that? Would a person know if they have colorectal cancer? Well, um, colon cancer can go undiagnosed because the symptoms may be really minor or non-existent during the early stages. So the signs and symptoms of colorectal cancer may not develop until the disease has progressed to like stage two or beyond. And what are the different stages? Well, stage zero, also called colon carcinoma, in situ abnormal cells are um, shown in the mucosa of the colon wall. And then stage one, colon cancer, the cancer is spread from the mucosa of the colon wall to the submucosa or the muscular layer. And then stage two, um, colon cancer, or stage 2A, um, we'll break it down into three stages. Right. So stage 2A, um, cancer has spread through the muscle layer of the colon wall to the serosa. Then stage 2B, cancer, has spread through the serosa, but has not spread to nearby organs. And then stage 2C, the cancer has spread through the serosa to nearby organs, and that's what I I know I've heard of before. Mm -hmm. And then stage 3, colon cancer, the cancer is spread through the mucosa of the colon wall to the submucosa, and may have even spread to the muscle layer, and or it has spread to um, three nearby lymph nodes or tissues near the lymph nodes, or the cancer has spread through the mucosa into the submucosa and four to six nearby lymph nodes. So it, there's very specific... When they stage it, right? Right. Um, and then stage four, uh, colon cancer, the cancer is spread through the blood and the lymph nodes to other parts of the body, such as the lung, the liver, the abdominal wall, or um, ovaries. And this is why it is so vital to get tested so that they can catch it as soon as possible. Well, is there a certain time it takes to go from one stage to another? Well, besides cancer being given stages, they are also given grades, and grades one, two, three, and four are used, and the cells that look very different from normal are given a grade of four and they are likely to spread faster than those in grade one. So the grade of cancer helps the doctor decide what treatment is best for you. Got it. Uh, Now let's talk a little bit about the symptoms. Early symptoms may affect only the colon and result in changes in bowel habits. Some changes in the bowel habits that may be considered colon cancer signs include a change in frequency of bowel movements, constipation, change in the consistency of stool, having loose or watery stools, having blood in the stools, either as bright red spots or dark tar-like stools, rectal bleeding, abdominal pain, bloating or cramps, and a persistent feeling that you cannot completely empty your bowels. The symptoms during the later stages of cancer, however, are varied. As symptoms develop, they may vary depending on the tumor size and the location in the large intestine. Of course, as the cancer grows, it may spread, producing systemic symptoms that affect your whole body, such as fatigue and weight loss. Right. Now, you may not know this, but the rectum itself is a different part of the digestive system and has its own cancer. Colon cancer starts in the colon. Rectal cancer starts in the rectum. I'll put a diagram on the website for listeners to learn more about the location of each of these parts of the digestive system. The symptoms of rectal cancer can be similar to those of other bowel diseases such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, but while symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease or IBS may subside during periods of remission, rectal cancer symptoms may be more severe and persistent as the cancer develops. Tumors in the rectum may change the consistency, shape, or frequency of bowel movements. Symptoms may increase and become more severe as the cancer spreads throughout the rectum or possibly into the colon. Rectal cancer signs related to bowel habits may include diarrhea, constipation, and inability to completely empty the bowel, bloody stool, and change in size or shape of the stools. Very similar to 
the symptoms of colon cancer. Right, and it's always good to look before you flush. Yes, look before you flush. And Jean, you were asking the other day about the higher risk of cancer from HPV. Right. And as it turns out, if a person does develop cancer from HPV, typically it's only involved in anal cancers, the anus being the last part of the digestive system or the exterior portion of the digestive system. And since this is colorectal, we won't be covering it today. Okay. Well, what are the risk factors? Is there any way to avoid developing it besides, obviously, getting screened? Right. Well, studies of large groups of people have shown an association between a typical Western diet and an increased risk of colon cancer. What I mean is a typical Western diet is high in fat and low in fiber. It's not quite clear why this occurs, but researchers are studying whether a high-fat, low-fiber diet affects the microbes that live in the colon or cause underlying inflammation that may contribute to cancer risk. This is an area of active investigation and research now is ongoing. And I know my doctor always said, um, get at least 34 grams of fiber a day. Right. There are other factors that may increase your risk of colon cancer. Those include older age. The great majority of people diagnosed with colon cancer are older than 50. Colon cancer can occur in younger people, but it occurs much less frequently. African-American race. African-Americans have a greater risk of colon cancer than do people of other races. A personal history of colorectal cancer or polyps. If you've already had colon cancer or adenomatosis adenomatosis polyps, thank you, Jean, you have a greater risk of colon cancer in the future. Okay. Inflammatory intestinal conditions. Chronic inflammatory diseases of the colon, such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, can increase your risk of colon cancer. Inherited syndromes that increase colon cancer risk. Genetic syndromes passed through generations of your family can increase your risk of colon cancer. These syndromes include familiar... Adenomatosis? Yes. Hmm. Say it again. I didn't read this one last time. Okay. Polyposis? Posis? Okay. Polyposis? And hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer is also known as Lynch syndrome. Why don't they just say Lynch syndrome in the beginning? I can say Lynch syndrome. Okay. But it's so known if, as, it's also you know, known as Lynch syndrome. So that's why if your family has had, if someone in your family has had colon cancer, it's important that you get You're checked, checked out. earlier, yes. right. Yes. Family history of colon cancer, you're more likely to develop colon cancer. If you have a parent, sibling, or a child with the disease, if more than one family member has colon cancer or rectal cancer, your risk is even greater. If you have a low fiber, high fat diet. Right. Colon cancer and rectal cancer may be associated with a diet low in fiber and high in fat and calories. Just like we do in yes. the Midwest. It, yes. Yeah. The Western civilization. Yeah. <laughs> get it again. Yes, we can't get it right. Research in this area has had mixed results. Some studies that have found an increased risk of colon cancer in people who eat diets high in red meat and processed meat. A sedentary lifestyle, which means you're not active. If you're inactive, you're more likely to develop colon cancer. Getting regular physical activity may reduce your risk of colon cancer. Diabetes. People with diabetes and insulin resistance have an increased risk of colon cancer. Obesity. People who are obese have an increased risk of colon cancer and an increased risk of dying of colon cancer when compared with people considered normal weight. People who smoke may have an increased risk of colon cancer. People who use alcohol heavily, not just like a glass of wine a day, but people who really drink heavily have a increased risk of colon cancer. People who have had radiation therapy for other cancers have an increased risk of colon cancer. Huh, I got through those. Mm-hmm. On the bright side, there are some things you can do to help yourself to not be one of the 200,000 people a year here in the U.S. Like what? Limit or stop drinking alcohol. Okay. The same with smoking. Watch your weight and exercise. And finally, eat a high-fiber, low-fat diet. That's right, Ron. um, You really can't do anything to, you know, change your heritage and your gene pool and your physical age. But since it is becoming more and more common, it does seem like a smart idea to just follow the guidelines you just pointed out. And I think those guidelines apply for a lot of things. Well, that's true. 
Absolutely. If a person does end up with cancer, the five-year survival rate drops considerably from stage one to four. So like you were saying, it's best to do the early screenings with the colonoscopy. To give you an idea, the five-year survival rate for stage one is 90%, wow. but that drops to 17 oh. if you're a stage four. Okay. So the bottom line is colonoscopies save lives. Uh, the bottom line? But um, yeah, bum, bum. I think that means we should wrap this episode up. <laughs> if our listeners have any questions or comments related to today's show, they can contact us at podcastdx at yahoo.com, through our website, podcastdx.com, on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or Instagram. And if you have a moment to spare, please leave us a review wherever you listen to this podcast. And please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regime. And never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this podcast. Till next week.